Let's continue with Peter Atiyah's Outlive, and this is the second part of our interpretation. In this section, let's delve into the mechanisms of longevity. While these insights may have limited practical guidance, they serve as an exercise for your thoughts. As we've discussed before, ordinary elderly stick to tradition, super-elderly seek innovation. If you aspire to longevity, you must be willing to exercise your brain. Peter Atia, in his book Outlive, presents a set of facts about centenarians for you to ponder. Consider what insights you might gain from these exceptional individuals. Within the population, only 0.03% are aged over 100. That's just one person among 3,000. Once someone reaches 100, the annual mortality rate rises to 36%, leading to a rapid decline in numbers. Those who make it to 110 are referred to as supercentenarians, and globally, there are never more than around 300 individuals in this category at any given time. If your life goal is to live to 110, perhaps consider a more achievable target. Becoming a billionaire, for instance. The ratio of people over 110 to those with a net worth of a billion dollars is 1 to 9. Very few reach the age of 117, and those who do are predominantly women. There is only one verified person in the world who lived to 120. It seems this might be the genetic upper limit for human lifespan. While the numbers are scarce, the existence of centenarians offers hope and demonstrates the possibility of longevity. If others can achieve it, why not us? Can we not take centenarians as role models and learn from their lifestyles? You've likely come across reports about centenarians, and these reports can be perplexing. They often mention habits like drinking alcohol and smoking, seemingly contradicting a healthy lifestyle. A person with low cognitive awareness might conclude that since centenarians smoke and drink, these habits aren't problematic at all. However, such thinking is flawed as these reports highlight individual cases. For those with a more informed perspective, statistical results are demanded. We need to understand the general lifestyle habits of centenarians. The answer is not particularly encouraging. Extensive studies indicate that, on average, centenarians do not prioritize health more than the general population. Many of them engage in heavy drinking, smoke for decades, and their rate of regular exercise at 70 is lower than their age-matched counterparts. Several also have overweight or obese body mass. So, why do they live so long? It likely boils down to the role of genetics. Research indicates that genetics contribute to 20% to 30% of an ordinary person's potential for longevity. However, as age increases, the importance of genetics becomes more pronounced. As we explored in Daniel E. Lieberman's book Exercised, good health before the age of 80 is largely determined by exercise, while after 80, genetics play a more significant role. Atia suggests that if you have siblings who are centenarians, your chances of reaching that age are several times higher than an average person. Similarly, if one of your parents is a centenarian, you also have a substantial likelihood of reaching a hundred. For those with moderate cognitive awareness, understanding the role of genetics might conclude the discussion. After all, genetics cannot be altered, and if someone is lucky, there's little one can do about it. However, individuals with higher cognitive awareness might pose another question. How exactly do these genes contribute to their longevity? Atia adopts a similar strategy. What do the genes of centenarians do for them? While we might not have those specific genes, can we achieve similar outcomes through different means? The more you learn about centenarians, the more you might envy them. They eventually succumb to death, and the causes are similar to those of ordinary individuals. Often the four horsemen mentioned earlier. However, what sets them apart is the timing at which these horsemen come for them. Much later than for the rest of us. When an ordinary person reaches 72, one in every five will have cancer. A centenarian reaches a 20% probability of cancer only at the age of 100. The likelihood of significant cardiovascular disease at 75 for an ordinary person is one in four, while a centenarian reaches this probability at 92. This trend applies to other age-related ailments like osteoporosis, stroke, dementia, hypertension, and more. Centenarians live healthily into old age, and suddenly encounter age-related diseases, followed by a swift demise. 
If lifespan is indeed limited, this is an ideal way to live. Their entire lifespan health curve has shifted approximately two to three decades to the right. At the age of 60, their coronary arteries are as healthy as those of a 35-year-old, and their appearance, sensory capabilities, and physical functions at 85 are comparable to a 60-year-old. Atiyah believes that their key characteristic is resilience, meaning their bodies can endure significant stress. Smoking for decades without developing cancer or cardiovascular diseases, irregular eating habits, and maintaining healthy metabolic functions. These individuals seem immune to the usual consequences. It's an enviable trait. This is the kind of person we aspire to be. But what makes their genes exceptional? The difficulty in research lies in the absence of a single longevity gene. Longevity is a result involving hundreds, possibly thousands, of genes working together, each contributing only slightly. It's easy to understand why evolution didn't favor the development of a specific longevity gene. Evolution is primarily concerned with reproduction. Natural selection predominantly occurs before reproducing offspring. Once the task of reproduction is complete, the impact of how long you live afterward is minimal for evolution. Females, even after menopause, may help care for grandchildren, providing some genetic advantage, while males, with no significant post-reproductive role, are less favored by evolution. Possibly explaining why males generally have shorter lifespans. Since longevity doesn't offer substantial genetic advantages, the good genes of centenarians are likely a result of a series of fortunate coincidences. However, after extensive research, scientists have identified several genes that play a crucial role in longevity. One such gene is APO, known for its significant impact on Alzheimer's disease, mainly because of its role in cholesterol transport in the brain. It has a variant that also affects glucose metabolism. Another gene is FOXO3, a transcription factor that determines whether other genes are activated or expressed, thereby regulating metabolism. It initiates cellular repair tasks and decides when to clear out cellular waste. These two genes provide valuable insights. Their presence suggests, firstly, to achieve longevity, you need to pay attention to cholesterol and glucose. Secondly, metabolism, cellular repair, and waste clearance are crucial. While scientists could reach similar conclusions from other directions, here you find clues to the underlying logic. With these clues, even if our gene versions differ from those of centenarians, we can still mimic their effects. For instance, the role of FOXO3 can be activated through exercise and nutritional regulation, even without having the specific gene version that centenarians possess. Centenarians may not provide us with genes, but they do offer clues. Their existence is a gift from nature to scientists. Nature also provides another clue to longevity. Rapamycin. We've mentioned rapamycin when discussing Peter H. Diamandis and Stephen Kotler's book The Future is Faster Than You Think, but the story is so legendary that it's worth repeating. Residing in the South Pacific is Easter Island, now part of Chile. Discovered by modern civilization in 1722, it was home to people who erected mysterious giant statues. In 1964, a Canadian scientific expedition visited Easter Island, and among them was a biochemist named Søren Sagal. He brought back a sample of soil from a volcano. Sagal discovered an antifungal substance in the soil, which he isolated and named rapamycin. Initially, rapamycin proved effective in treating athlete's foot. Later, it was found to be an immunosuppressant. Today, it's used in organ transplant surgeries to reduce the body's rejection of new organs. It's also utilized in arterial stent procedures to prevent blood vessels from closing again. In 2007, rapamycin was approved for the treatment of a type of kidney cancer. All these details are not the crucial part. What matters is that in 2009, after multiple laboratories repeatedly confirmed it, Rapamycin was found to significantly extend the lifespan of mice. Particularly, it could extend the lifespan of elderly mice, equivalent to making a 60-year-old person live up to 95. Easter Island has gifted us a longevity drug. But hold your excitement. Rapamycin has side effects. Don't forget it's an immunosuppressant, lowering the body's immune response. This is why, until now, 
no one has taken it as a longevity drug. You might ask, what's the use of living longer if your immune system is compromised? Well, it's not that simple. A study in 2014 brought hope. It discovered that in some patients, after using rapamycin, not only did the immune system not weaken, but it actually improved. One speculation is that if you consistently take low doses of rapamycin, your immune system will decline. However, if you take high doses for a period, stop for a while, and then resume. Using it periodically, your immune system might strengthen. But this is still speculative. Some experiments with dogs seem promising. Inflammation in the dogs decreased, and rapamycin seemed to suppress the activity of aging cells. Yet, until now, the US FDA has not approved any human trials. Atiyah himself, along with some of his patients, has already experimented with rapamycin. He mentioned that periodic usage indeed seems to reduce side effects, but it's still wise to wait for formal experimental results. The cognitive question is how rapamycin achieves the promotion of longevity. One mechanism discovered is that it affects an intracellular protein complex, called MTOR. The role of MTOR is to balance the relationship between the growth and reproductive needs of an organism and the supply of nutrients. When food is abundant, MTOR is activated, and cells enter growth mode, rapidly dividing, conducive to reproduction. When food is scarce, MTOR is inhibited, and cells enter a recycling mode. Some cellular components are broken down. A kind of cleanup. While cell division and growth slow down, or stop. In simple terms, rapamycin, by influencing MTOR, regulates cell division and growth, thereby improving the organism's lifespan. In simpler terms, a state of fasting favors longevity. People have known for a long time that eating less can lead to a longer life, and experiments with various animals have repeatedly proven this point. But, you don't want to use fasting as a method, because it also has side effects. Fasting can make your constitution worse. Your resistance weakens, and you might die from infection or cold. Isn't that a significant trade-off? The brilliance of rapamycin influencing the MTOR mechanism is perhaps that it allows for the optimization of cell metabolism while ensuring an adequate energy supply. This is what we're looking for. Centenarians or rapamycin, nature has presented us with clues to longevity. Scientists have identified some cellular-level mechanisms based on these clues that can regulate the aging process in humans. In practical terms, the most crucial aspect is nutrition. Intake and handling of nutrients. The common effect of longevity genes, and rapamycin seems to be that even with an indulgent diet, cellular metabolism can be automatically regulated. This is what we desire. The combined effect of longevity genes, and rapamycin appears to be the automatic regulation of cellular metabolism even in casual eating situations. But what if you don't have longevity genes, and can't currently take rapamycin? We'll discuss that later on. In the next section, we will talk about type 2 diabetes. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.